The good people in the world need to know that FanDuel is not only America's number one sports book, it is the only sports book, the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. Right now, brand new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a simple $5 bet. That's $200 in bonus bets, win or lose, by placing a $5 bet. So if you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there's no better time to get in on the action than right now. The app is so easy to use, and there's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, over-unders, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash UCSS to kick off the NFL season. You can also bet on NBA action, NHL action, the World Series. If you can think of it, FanDuel's got odds for it. Check them out at FanDuel.com slash UCSS. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL and an official partner of the Ultimate Cleveland Sports Show. And with that, we welcome in Corbin Smith of the Locked on Seahawks podcast. Corbin, how you doing this morning, my man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Look at that, the Doug Baldwin jersey. Yeah, yeah the, love great, it. the highlighter. <laughs> I, like I love that. it. I love it. So uh, we, you know, pay attention to all the teams in the NFL. Obviously, the Seahawks. I'll give you my thumbnail assessment of this team. Uh, I think they've got good quarterback play. I think their defense is sensational, and I think most of the fan base nationally may have underrated just how good this team is. Am I close? I think that you are on the precipice of what this team can be. I, I don't think they've played up to their potential to this point. And a lot of it has to do with the red zone issues they've had on offense. I think they're really close. I've been saying this all week. It, it feels like more so than the Bengals game coming out of that game that this offense is really close to popping. I mean, Geno Smith completed 75% of his passes against the Cardinals last weekend, and he made some really impressive throws in that game. But two weeks in a row, he's had some uh, knucklehead decisions making interceptions in the red zone, which we didn't see from him last year most of the season, and he knows he can't do that. So it's little things like that that are holding them back right now. But they've had five different offensive lines starting in front of Geno Smith, and they've still been able to have a top-10 scoring offense. So it feels like this team is just on the cusp of finally figuring things out. And with all the weapons that they've got, even without DK Metcalf, I mean, Jake Bobo last week had a touchdown, and he's been a revelation. I'm still not rookie. sure he was inbounds. Yeah, that, that was awfully <laughs> close, man. His foot looked like it could have been touching a little bit of the white there, yeah, but it was a great, it was a great catch. great catch, You're right. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, yeah. what's interesting, I watched that whole uh, – I, I watched some of the Cardinals Seahawks. I watched all of the Bengals Seahawks. And, you know, you talk about the – like the Bengals – uh, the, the Seahawks were moving the ball the whole game with ease to the 20. And then the, it was like they couldn't protect Geno in the red zone. He was getting yep. killed in the red zone almost every time. Like they had that, obviously that first drive was great. They went right into the end zone, but they could not get it in after that. What is, you talked about all the changes on the offensive line. Where are they on the offensive line right now? Because obviously the Browns got a lot better pass rush uh, than the Cardinals do. Yeah, well, here's the thing. The pass protection last week was fantastic. Yeah. Geno Smith didn't take a single hit in that game, that, at least in my opinion, that was responsible from the offensive line. He had one play he got sacked where it was on a bootleg and Zayvon Collins read the play immediately. There was nothing the offensive line could do there. It was just the structure of the play. But uh, the pass protection was fantastic last week. But they're not going to have Abe Lucas back this week. I don't know when he's going to be back, but – there's a good chance that they will have both their starting center and their right guard, Evan Brown and Phil Haynes, back this week. If not, they've been happy with the play they've gotten from the rookies, Ola Ola Timmy and uh, Anthony Bradford. Both those guys have played really well in their first NFL action. So it's weird saying this with how bad offensive lines have been in Seattle. You would think in the past with their history, if they had the injuries they've had this year, you'd be thinking Geno Smith is <clears throat> not even going to be out on the field. And yeah. they have found ways to make it work. This is the best depth that they've had up there in the entire Pete Carroll era. So yeah. that's the positive. The negative is there's a chance that they're going to have multiple backups still out there against Cleveland's defensive line. And we saw what Cincinnati was able to do a few weeks ago. And yeah. as you mentioned, Gino, everybody, there, there was a lot of fans saying, why not put Drew Locke in there? It's like, what are, why are you blaming Gino Smith for this? Gino Smith had less than one and a half seconds on most of these plays yeah. to throw the football in the red zone. He had no fighting chance. When he's had time to throw, he's been just as good, if not better, than last year. It's just been difficult with the offensive line injuries they've had. Hey, I'll tell you, Seattle is one of – I've been to Seattle twice in my life. I've had a great time both times I've been there. I don't know if you actually live in Seattle, Corbin, do you? Do you live in Seattle? or in? 
Uh, not currently, but yeah. uh, I, I've, I've lived there for several years of my life. Okay. So. It's a great city, but uh, I'm guessing, you know, marijuana is legal in Washington, so maybe those people talking with Drew Locker are all stoned. That's the only thing I can imagine. <laughs> but speci- Gino's been great. Specifically in on Gino. This is, the Gino story is one of the most amazing stories in the NFL. Right. And it got talked about a lot last year. And yeah, he hasn't been quite as good this year, but he's still been good. And... But even at the end of 2021, when he played a little bit there, he played well. Like, this guy was terrible for a decade whenever he played. And he comes to Seattle, and he's a completely different quarterback. No, but he's not a superstar, but he's a perfectly good quarterback in the NFL. Like, he's top half. He's somewhere probably between 10 and 15. It's amazing, because he was not even, you never thought he would ever be any good. You rarely see a story like this, where a guy stinks for a decade And now he's a pretty good quarterback. How do you explain this? I think the talent was always there. But, I mean, look at the track record for the New York Jets developing quarterbacks. (laughs) You know, sometimes there's just organizations that don't know how to develop QBs. And Geno, I don't (laughs) think – We know what you're talking about. I think his confidence was hurting a lot coming out of New York. He'll he'll not admit that, but I I think that his confidence was completely shot. And leave it to Pete Carroll to be the one – I mean. Pete Carroll is a defensive coach, but coming out of this Russell Wilson trade, seeing the way that Wilson's played in Denver, how things have gone for the Broncos, I mean, at some point you have to look at the long-term track record. Pete Carroll almost won a national championship at USD with John David Booty as the quarterback. I mean, this guy guy knows how to put together an offense that is going to be successful regardless of who the quarterback is. I mean, I am confident that if Drew Locke had to play a handful of games – that the Seahawks offense could be functional and do a good job because he just has such a long track record of being able to put his quarterbacks in a position where they can succeed and they play with confidence. And now we're seeing how much he truly had an impact on Russell Wilson's success in Seattle. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, Russell <clears throat> Russell didn't know it at the time, but uh, he misses him for sure. And I, I think you're absolutely onto something. Pete Carroll is one of those guys, if you're in a room with him, you feel better. Just, just being around him, he's got so much energy, he's upbeat, and I think the rub-off factor on his players, and particularly on Geno, has made all the difference in the world. And you see it. He was terrible with the Jets. He is a more yeah. than serviceable quarterback right now. You know, Corbin, um, you, you know, we, we possibly are going to have P.J. Walker coming here. And, you know, it's weird. I picked the Browns to beat the 49ers at home, but I've always marked this game as a game was going to be very difficult for the Cleveland Browns to win. Um, you, you know, you look at your, your performances uh, that you had in like, prior weeks, you guys are getting after the quarterback. Um, this defense, I, I wouldn't say it's the Legion of Boom, but what, what are some things that they're going to try to do if P.J. Walker is the quarterback um, going into one of the most difficult places to play? Well, first and foremost, stopping the run is going to be the number one priority for the Seahawks defense. And it's incredible the transformation they've had. They were 30th in the league last year in run defense. And this year, for most of the season, they've been first in yards per carry allowed. And it's the Bobby Wagner factor. He is still a phenomenal player at 33 years old. In fact, in training camp, I was making this comment when I was watching. There was a play on DJ Dallas, one of their running backs. He was stride for stride with him on a wheel route I'm like Bobby Wagner looks faster at 33 than he did at 31 and he's playing like that on the field right now for the Seahawks but he has had an infectious effect on the rest of this defense from a run defense standpoint so if they can bottle up Cleveland's run game that old school style offense they're gonna be running particularly without Deshaun Watson then really just put the ball into P.J. Walker's court. And he's going to have to deal with that secondary. And I'm saying this right now. I said it yesterday. Devin Witherspoon is already the best player in Seattle's defense. And that's no offense to Bobby Wagner. Just said he's having a great season. Some of the other stars the Seahawks have. But this kid is flat out special. He is a playmaker in all facets. And if P.J. Walker is not careful with the football, number 21 is going to intercept him this week. He's that kind of a talent. He's flashed. He is although, really, really good. Although, uh, uh, he didn't. A, a DK Metcalf should have stayed quiet on the Jamar or him shutting down Jamar Chase. I'll tell you that, though. No, he did a but great he did, job though. on Chase. Yeah. He, he didn't give up a catch to him that game. 
And he, he lived up to the billing. I mean, he, the Did thing Jamar is, Jamar Chase Kevin have 80 yards and a touchdown away that from game? it. He was excited to go against Jamar Chase. He's that kind of a player. He, Corbin, he I got your back here. Yeah, Did no. Chase have 80 yards no, and a touchdown on, that Bolt, game? Listen, not not let, on let him. Let me give you the advanced analytics here because, Corbin, I was looking this up this morning because yeah. Devin Witherspoon's in our uh, – our five stats you have to know. Against okay. Jamar Chase and one-on-one coverage in that game, three targets, one catch, three yards, two pass breakups. Yeah, he was all I mean, over. it's three targets. Okay, fair enough. Chase had a good game. Well, it's, it's because it's Joe Burrow was not – he was not stupid enough to throw the ball at him. Yeah, he the was three targets – no, I think he's right. The three targets tells you how well he did. Like, it's not like he was fair open. He's, you know, Burrow's he, smart enough to Did he that. have 80 yards that game or am I making it up? But it was, I know it was against him. I, I thought they held him. I'd have to look back at the numbers, but they he right had now. one big play in the first quarter, and after that, they really shut him down. Yeah, that was such a weird game because... He did have 80 yards, Bull. You were correct. Be, right, Six catches, 80 yards, Seahawks, but he had 13 targets. Because the Bengals marched for a touchdown, and then the Seahawks marched for a touchdown, and then the Bengals marched for a touchdown again, and then neither team could get the ball could do anything really after that. But anyway, all right, so, he, so this guy's the real deal. The Seahawks have drafted... So well the last couple of years, that's made the difference, right? I mean, because the team was starting to flounder, and the last two years they have drafted so well, including with they the- have. And I feel like John Schneider, and I've been saying this for the last couple of years. I feel like he looked in the mirror and realized, like, we need to stop trying to be cute and acting like we're smarter than everybody else. And instead, they've just gone out and drafted good football players. What what a novel idea! They've picked guys that are outstanding football players, and also the other theme. They've been picking guys that were captains and they were leaders in their football team. Those are the two things they're looking for. They want stud football players and they want guys that have the leadership aspect. And that's why these guys have been able to come in last year's class. I mean, boy, Mafe was probably like their fifth best rookie last year and he has been phenomenal this season. That class is loaded. This year's draft class, they're getting a lot of key contributions led by Witherspoon, Jackson Smith, and Jigba starting to figure things out. So they have really retooled how they're evaluating players and the guys that are bringing in, and you're seeing the results in the field. We haven't even mentioned Kenneth Walker, who I think is one of the top probably five backs in the league. I I thought Zach Charbonnet – how do you pronounce his last name? Charbonnet? Charbonnet. Charbonnet. I thought he would play more of a role, but they haven't really – I know he's been banged up. I think he didn't play last week. But Kenneth Walker is so good, it's, it's really hard to take him off the field. Yeah, and I've been arguing the red zone issues that that's where Zach Charbonnet can really help this football team, and we haven't seen that come to fruition yet. But Walker is like a video game out there with the jump cuts. It's ridiculous. He he had a run last week. I mean, Arizona's run defense was actually fairly decent in this game, but there was one play where he juked, and it looked like he jump cut about six yards in like a split second, and then boom, he's gone, 20-plus yard run. And he just has that ability to be a ping pong ball and just bounce all over the place. And, and it's really fun to watch. Now, it can be frustrating sometimes because there are times he tries too hard to do that kind of stuff. But I think he has done a better job this year than last year of being decisive and getting downhill when he needs to. Corbin, is Metcalf going to be – I know he was a, a game-time decision last week, didn't play. Are we, are we expecting him back for Seattle this week? I would say right now that it's probably a 50-50 proposition, but knowing how DK is programmed, if he's going to be anywhere close to being ready to go, then then he'll be ready to play. So if I had to make a prediction right now, I expect he'll be out there. I don't think he's going to miss a second straight game. Killing my fantasy team the last couple of years. <laughs> Let's go. Uh, what's your prediction for the game? Corbin. So, man, I... I always wait till our Friday show in Locked on Seahawks to give a score prediction, but I just... I have a feeling that this is going to be kind of one of those old school, low scoring, grind it out type games. I think the weather could also be a factor potentially. I, I just, I think that the quarterback situation gives Seattle a clear advantage here. And I think Geno Smith, he knows the mistakes he's made in the red zone the last couple of weeks. I think he's going to be a little more effective in that regard. So I give Seattle the edge here playing at home with Geno Smith over P.J. Walker. If Watson was playing and healthy, then maybe we're having a little different discussion. But I think it's going to be a really close game. I think the Cleveland Browns defense is legit. But I think Seattle, with Geno Smith and some of the weapons they've got, I think that they've got a good chance to get this victory and and stay with the 49ers in the NFC West. But it is going to be a really good game. I think it'll be tight. 
I think the 12th man could be the difference, too, because yeah, communicate, always, you're a backup a quarterback. Factor. You're going to try communicating at the line. Uh, the crowd's going to know what they're dealing with, and they're going to be extra loud. Uh, Corbin, our producer McNuggets has a question for you before we let you go. go well, ahead, you just mentioned the 12th man, Jay. That's what I wanted to ask about. Corbin, you obviously have lived in Seattle. You cover this team. Earlier this year, They, the crowd helped draw Carolina to eight false starts, which was the most since 2011. How real is that 12th man effect, mm-hmm. and how much, di- how much more difficult would it make it for a backup or third-string quarterback in that situation? So it's weird. You, you look at the last couple years, I have felt like the home field advantage at Lumen Field has not been what it used to be, but something has changed this year. It's, it's almost like the fans that were there in 2013 and 2014 started getting tickets again. It has been totally different and I think some of it has just been some of these rookies and some of these young players like the fans love Devin Witherspoon and they love Jake Bobo like Jake Bobo built him a statue already they love him there and so players like that have really endeared to this fan base and I think you're seeing a lot of the diehard longtime fans are making their way back to the stadium and you can tell with the noise the noise factor is back in Seattle very good yeah Hey, listen, Corbin, thanks, thanks for coming Corbin. on. I have to ask, man, the, the mutton chops are on point. Is that like a Millard <laughs> Fillmore inspiration? Or I, I love the look, bro. Who's looks like, that, a, hey, looks you, like a second baseman. You can't baseman grow hair on seven. top of your head. You've got to get creative. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, Corbin. It looks great, man. Thanks, thanks. bro. Appreciate it.